You're at the Steve. You're at the Espo. You're at the combination Steve and Espo. Espo is to unearthing great new music what Crayola is to unearthing new colors. Medium deep rose. Deep almond. Deepest almond. Anticipation strangles the internet before every review I post with a kind of wet hunger only otherwise seen when Benjamin Moore announced its 2022 paint color of the year, October Mist. Well, last episode was episode five, which must mean let's talk about six, baby. Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be. Thank you. There was actually a faux Shakespearean line in that song that went, Many will know, anything goes. Ooh la la. This was a weird time for hip-hop. I think it maybe felt the eyes of the world accepting it, finally, and it went a little overboard with the formality. It was around the same time that Bismarcky, rest in peace, uh, appeared in the video for Just a Friend while wearing a powdered wig because he was playing a rock and roll lick on a piano. You must have heard Roll Over Beethoven and said, I don't get it. Even up to and through the impacts of Public Enemy and NWA, it seemed like every third or fourth rap single was a gimmick. You liked your chances in 1987 if you were Run DMC or LL Cool J and your main competition was the Fat Boys and uh, whoever this guy is. Sorry, I had to go there. Too early? Too early, right? Too late, mother. All pop genres go through the gimmick phase. Uh, without getting into the academics of what would be considered early jazz, it was littered with songs like A Tisket, A Tasket, and Pennsylvania 65000. Ronnie James Dio, of all people, um, before embarking on a career singing about magic and rainbows, um, they complained that his early career in rock and roll was was trashed with songs about baby baby and boy girl hits. What we have this episode, I keep wanting to say week. We have this episode. Let's talk about six. Get in the zone, baby. All right. We are still in the anti-genre gravity machine, so my apologies if your stomach can't quite handle it. Espo will give you heavy, baby, with the dose of Seattle's old iron. Then veer from the Kafka-esque R&B of Ray Angry and Jay Horde to the multinational harmonies of Jane Ellen Bryant and Tara Lightfoot, plus the L.A. hardcore in Birth Old City. But first, Old Boy by the Austral-Korean juggernaut, 1-300. What has two thumbs and is going to stop teasing forthcoming songs at the end of his videos? This guy in the teaser for this video at the end of the last episode. I mentioned that 1300 was Korean hip hop. That's only partially true because they rap in Korean and in English because they grew up in Australia. It's an important distinction to make. Speaking of gimmicks, because it's easy to look at the group, let your mind drift to BTS, and then conclude 1300 is an opportunistic contrivance. I've been critical of Australia in previous episodes, but the good news is that 1300 is rated E for everyone. Well, they use the B word in Old Boy, so not completely. But Old Boy in its video are a tribute to a 20-year-old Korean cult classic. But that's not really important to know to enjoy the song. It's kind of like, you know, you don't need to know that Who Let the Dogs Out was claimed to have been written by up to nine people, that its key phrase comes from the Caribbean and is actually a pro-feminist statement, and also that it was the top-selling indie single of the 90s. Some of the praise for 1300 and Old Boy is somewhat backhanded and bigoted. It's like, yeah, it's in Korean, but it's great. I'd actually argue that old boy is rock and roll. Number one, it's alive. Number two, it's obnoxious. Number three, it's for the young. And number four, it's completely addictive. 
it has the sensation of the Beastie Boys or Wu-Tang, where you don't know if you're dealing with two guys or with 20, but shit, might as well join the party. Links are below. On Planetesimal, Old Iron have gone primordial. Very old school. Concert band old school. I say this because music written for many large bands is in the key of B flat, since a lot of instruments, particularly brass instruments, especially the trumpet, sound sonically at home in B flat. Now, the opening a riff of planetesimal sounds like the guitars are tuned down to D flat, which is already a step and a half below standard tuning for a six string instrument. However, once the riff gets to slamming around, it sounds as if it really is in B flat, at which point, why are we not just playing bass? I mean, Spinal Tap proved with Big Bottom that not only can you do that, but you can be lovable too. The challenge this poses for Old Iron and other metal bands of this ilk is that detuned guitars or guitars with thicker strings can sound rubbery and rattling. Heavy metal blubber! But Old Iron use this to their advantage. When I hear Planetesimal, and this song is not pirate metal, though that is a real thing, I imagine like a wooden old warship crashing against the waves, only in this case the sea is a thick, muddy pit of oil and it's on fire. Um, the violent changes in speed and momentum thrash the song about it's kind of like when you're on a roller coaster and you get jerked around now more days instead of that smooth ride we used to get and then you're about to get off and the operator keeps jerking it as it pulls into the station that's pretty similar to the momentum shifts and violent lurches on display here so in that regard the thick rattling strings are part of the sonic score links are below Also, in that ill-fated teaser for this episode that I referred to previously, I referred to The Metamorphosis by Ray Angry and Jay Horde as Space Age R&B. I think I did that because, A, the repetition of the phrase in space throughout the song, as well as using it as a synonym of sorts for something futuristic. It turns out I was actually misusing the phrase because it more specifically refers to the thoughts and ideas of the future and living in outer space from the eyes of people who lived during the space race in the 1960s. From that vantage, I don't know what space age R&B would be. Sun Ra, A Walk Through Your Mind by The Temptations, Eight Ball and MJG. Could they have predicted that? Whatever, it was my faux pas. Consider it revenge on all you stooges who frequently misuse begs the question. My thinking was that it would be ear candy for that Morpheus-looking dude in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure because there's no way he's listening to whatever that's supposed to be. I also think my futuristic characterization of the metamorphosis was partly based on that Prince snare thunderclap sound, <laughs> which was actually produced several years before Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, so suddenly I seem like I don't know what I'm talking about. Right, suddenly. The Metamorphosis is a tense, anxiety-riddled song about the pressures of a culture driven more by style than substance. What culture could that possibly be? Ray Angry has worked with Prince D'Angelo and Elvis Costello, and he based the song on the novella by Franz Kafka of the same name. Kafka, who often dealt with themes of anxiety and alienation, is all over this song. He also dealt a lot with themes that were absurd. The book, which I have not read, uh, is about a man who turns into an insect and has to deal with not only his changing perceptions of the outside world, but of the world's changing perception of him. It dovetails nicely with the song because it's absurd that more people haven't heard it. The song features dramatically unfolding synth chords 
that gets stressful and stormy before trying to make room to breathe and relax. It also features digitized South American percussion, or at least what I discern to be as such based on several culturally accurate films that I have viewed. It's not the space age of the Jetsons, unless you subscribe to the stressful belief that the Jetsons were living above a post-apocalyptic wasteland inhabited by the Flintstones. I mean, how else do you explain? Links are below. In the same arena as, this tastes like crap, try it, is, oh, I've got this great story, only it turns out to be heartbreaking and upsetting. For instance, we have this family friend. This family friend has a brother. This brother has recently got a new girlfriend, and he's moved in with his girlfriend. Aww. Boring, but cute, right? So, he moved in with her. He moved in with her and her twin babies. Oh, great. That's heartwarming. Stand-up guy. hard local woman needs a helping hand. That's a good story. He moved in with her and her twin babies and the father of her twin babies. Hmm, okay. It's unusual. But this is northern Wisconsin, and even low-income places have been hit with rising housing costs. So they're just being pragmatic, right? This other man is the legal father to both of the twin babies, but the biological parent to only one of them. Say again. The woman, the girlfriend, was impregnated by this man in one encounter. A couple days later, she was impregnated by a different man in a separate encounter. The two fetuses then grew together. This can happen. Look it up. She gave birth, and the second father was then soon after killed in a motorcycle accident. It's a really sad story, and we couldn't wait to tell everyone. It's the sort of thing you tell in a crowded restaurant, and the people, the other diners, slowly stop eating so they can eavesdrop a little better. There was this time when I was a teenager and my best friend was telling this really pornographic joke inside a Taco Bell. And the only sound you could hear in the buildup to the joke in between the lines was this police officer sitting at a table 20 feet away doing this. <laughs> Somebody was going to find out by Jane Ellen Bryant and Tara Lightfoot is a gorgeous folk song. Even though they aren't in the same band together, they aren't even co-citizens, the former being from Austin, Texas, the latter being from Ontario, they aren't even non-biological twins, but their voices entwine magically. The song was written and recorded for season two of Song Confessional, which is a podcast whereby readers send in their personal tales, selected songwriters are then chosen to adapt these, and then they are recorded in a mobile studio. Um, past participants include Kat Edmondson, Kerry Rodriguez, Jake Lloyd, and even the punk band Chick Chick Chick. The winning story chosen for Bryant and Lightfoot was sent in by a woman who, when she was a young girl, found out her father was cheating on, his, on her mother, informed the mother, and then the father blamed the young girl for the breakup of the marriage and ruining his life. He then disappeared, leaving her with this burden to carry around. Lightfoot and Bryant spin the song as a way of assuaging the woman's fears that this was not her fault. It's a great song. Sad story. <sighs> How you like that, Berthold City? How you like sitting and waiting? Actually, I went and saw Sigaros a week ago, the glacial atmospheric band from Iceland. And towards the end of the set, it started playing this song for no more than five seconds and then held silent for 30 solid seconds. The Sigaros fans went ape. We'd been sitting in polite silence for more or less two hours, you know, applauding at the end of things, but it's a pretty sober experience. But at this point, people couldn't take anymore. Women were 
waving their arms and speaking in tongues like at a revival meeting, just big lusty Woo! Anyway, the break ends and Sigur Rose plays for another 30 seconds, stops again, but this time total silence from everyone. It was the strangest audience behavior I have ever seen at a concert. Now, hardcore punk rock is about economy. Lean songs that trim the fat, they don't chew it. With This Regret by Berthold City uses precious seconds doing this half-speed, hardcore dither. Witness. It kicks off, and you sit there staring at the track length. 2 minutes and 33 seconds, which is already long for hardcore. 50 seconds pass. You start to grow concerned. Is this all there is to the song? 60 seconds? You sweat a little bit. They release this as a single? 70 seconds. And that sense of nausea, then it kind of turns into a tingle. There's a four count coming on a hi-hat here. I can feel it. And then 80 seconds, bam, we're off. It's a very metal kind of hardcore. Not quite as LA guitar as DRI and suicidal tendencies, but it's like hearing the Black Flag influence in Persistence of Time era anthrax. It's controlled chaos. Barely. The members of Berthold City are members of various other former hardcore bands. And one article I read said that they don't really want to talk about them much because they don't want to ride the coattails of past successes. Success being an extremely relative term. <laughs> um, so I will follow suit and not disclose them either. But the song pretty much lets you know that these aren't kids screwing around. This is a pretty professional hardcore punk rock band, and, and it sounds that way. The downside of hardcore at my age is that by the time I get to liking a song and wanting to get up and stomp around a little bit, the song's pretty much over. Um, with this regret, is kind of like a hand extended from the stage then. To, and it's, it's not like a bait and switch, like to pull the hand back and then a waffle from Doc Martin kicks you in the forehead and off you go. Um, it lets you get up and then feel it and then it's just a blur of mic cords and cymbals and boots. Even better. It's not the 80s anymore. You don't have to pinpoint rewind to get to that part where the explosion happened. You just drag your mouse over and click. Links are below. Hit like, hit subscribe, check out all the links below. I'm going to get around to an issue, teaser alert, um, featuring songs from the past couple years that still are very unknown. There's just so much good music right now in 2022 that that's just going to have to wait, all right? The difference between the